Hello friends, I'm Kendra Winchester. Welcome back to my channel. And we are going to be talking about the second half of my January reading. Um, in a previous video, which I will link somewhere around here, I talked about the first half of my January reading wrap up. And I did 10 books there and I'm going to do 10 books today. Theoretically, they should be about the same length. We'll see what happens. Uh, but yeah, I read I read a lot of books in January because I, I really haven't been feeling well. So my energy is all over the place, but we're here to talk about books. Um, I have my handy dandy notebook here of all the books that I read. And if you're wondering, how do I like make a list of books that I read when I cannot read text? I just wanted to show you this. I do, I print out little stickers of the covers and then I stick them in this little book and I'm able to look down and see the cover and remember what I read. You know, look, these are the small hacks that you have to do when you're in books and reading and you can't read text, especially, I'm, it's really bad right now. So anyway, if you would like to use it, please feel free. Um, I use the Canon Ivy. There's now a Canon Ivy 2, which I would recommend over the one because there are some issues with the one uh, in regards to color of the stickers, but I just print them out, cut them out, stick them in, and it helps me do these videos. So, you know. We'll take a win. So my favorite novel of the month is The Reformatory by Tanana Reed Du. This book is set in Northern Florida and it features Robbie, who's a 12 year old black boy who lives with his sister, Gloria. Um, they, or their father has fled the area because he was trying to unionize a, a mill of some kind and uh, they did not want a black man, you know, in the 1950s organizing unions. So he fled. Um, they, they had a woman, a white woman come up and say that she had been sexually assaulted by him. And so they were able to run him out of, of the area. And so he is now living in Chicago. Um, and so he's left his two kids with um, an older woman who's kind of like their guardian. Uh, their mom died of cancer so their dad is a single dad trying to do all of this and so he flees to Chicago. So this kind of leaves Gloria and Robbie in a bind as you can imagine. Um, and so when a white, I guess son of a local farmer uh, makes advances on Gloria, Robbie kicks him. And so through that, he's able, they're able to like grab him and kind of use him to try to draw their dad out of hiding. But they grab him, they take him to court, without any sort of trial, they send him to the reformatory, which is sort of like, uh, it's not, it's not. A, they call it a school, it's not a school, it is a horrific work camp type situation. This is a work of horror, so uh, it is a lot. I, it's sort of, uh, I feel like a lot of people might be more familiar with these types of places because of Colson Whitehead's The Nickel Boys. Um, but what Tanana Reeb Do does is add supernatural elements because Robbie can see ghosts. And so he's able to see all of these boys who have died at this school. Uh, there is a lot of content warnings for violence and sexual violence towards um, children, uh, women. Uh, there's uh, racism, just horrific things happen to these boys. And so just as a heads up going into it, uh, but Tanana Reebdu has done so much research on this and she dedicates this book to her uncle who actually died in one of these schools. And um, it's a deeply moving novel. It's, I think it's just an example of Dew at, at her best where she's taking very real elements that are horrific and combining them with some genre elements of horror and just creating this beautiful story. Uh, when Robbie is in the, in the reformatory, Gloria is doing everything under the sun to free her brother so that they can flee and go join their father in Chicago. It's such a good book. It's such a good book. Um, very harrowing. It is kind of long, um, but worth worth it. It's it's so good. So the next three books are actually rereads. So I'm going to talk about kind of my thoughts on uh, rereading this uh, trilogy. I haven't read it in several years. So this is the Bartimaeus trilogy by Jonathan Stroud. Stroud is he's just a really quirky kind of funny middle grade and YA author. This book originally came out when I was like 13 I think. And so I absolutely loved this book when I first listened to it. Uh, it is just 
it is amazing. Um, the narrator, whose name I'll put on the screen, he does a phenomenal job and he actually plays one of the butlers in, I think it's the Gilded Age on HBO right now. And I heard his voice while I was watching this show and I was like, I know that voice. And it, it is, <laughs> it was the narrator of the Bartimaeus trilogy. Um, so this is about a young 12 year old magician in an alternative London and magicians actually summon demons to perform, um, their magic for them. But you know, regular people uh, can't see them. They call them commoners. Commoners cannot see them. And so uh, we have this little boy, Nathaniel, who really wants to get back at his master and at this other magician that his master knows, and uh, he call it summons Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus's sections are written in first person. They include like um, footnotes and all sorts of things. And so each book, it looks at Nathaniel at a different age and their relationship together. One of the things that is great about this book is it teaches kids about footnotes first off. It's super funny, but it's also very class conscious. That's the whole point is like commoners versus magicians. So the elite class versus commoners. So I did appreciate that. There's a lot of organizing in this book. A third POV is introduced in um, the second book and I won't tell you what it is because that would be a spoiler but there we really get a behind the scenes at like the resistance the commoners resistance against the elites and that is really interesting but I I, I don't think that while, while all of that is great I don't I think once you start scratching the surface to be on some of that it doesn't hold up in places for sure uh, like the M word for little people is used at least once in each book. And I was like, oh, right. Like, I mean, you could say it's a different time or whatever. It's still offensive. So like I, and these are older print editions also. So maybe they have switched it out at this point in more recent editions. Um, but all of these are the original hardcovers. So I don't know. I wish, I wish you would just swap it out. It's a kid's book. It's not that hard. Anyway, I digress. Um, and also, you know, the magicians, they summon demons who are from um, the other place. It does play on who's the bad guy and who's the good guy. And But there is some cultural appropriation about different cultures, like spiritual beliefs. Um, and there are very few um, characters of color in, in the series. Not a lot. Uh, and so I do feel like there are some issues. Granted, yes common at the time but still an issue so if you were you know you have kids in your life they go and they pick this up they have a great time awesome you know you can have conversations with them or whatever but like if I could choose between this book and a different book I would probably choose the other book if I was going to get kids buy them but if your kids just want to read it, it they're fine and there's a lot of great conversations about class in here so you know um, my mom has a saying um, you eat the meat, spit out the bones. I feel like you kind of have to do that with this. So just as a heads up, I read them mostly for nostalgia, but if you are new to them, you know, you can take all of that into consideration of the Bartimaeus trilogy. I may have already reviewed these on this channel, but I don't think I really delved into some of the ways they don't hold up as much, but I could be totally wrong, who knows? But this is the updated, do these books hold up? Sometimes, sometimes they hold up. But I still love Jonathan Stroud's books and he's very funny. Okay, so next up is a book I, I really enjoyed and that is Come and Get It by Kylie Reed. Um, this is the author of Such a Funny Age. I really enjoyed, um, I think it's Nicole Lewis who performs the audiobook of this. One of the things I love about Kylie Reed is the dialogue. And so this is about Millie, a young black woman at the University of Arkansas who's like an RA, a resident assistant, and she has sat out, and so she's older than most of the other students. She sat out a year, coming back to finish her senior year, and her really goal after graduation is to buy a house. She doesn't know exactly why she wants to buy one so quickly, but that is her dream. <laughs> and so she, meets this visiting professor. Um, what is the visiting professor's name? Agatha, who is a writer, who's an, also a visiting professor. Uh, Agatha has just broken up with her wife, and so they are kind of spending this time apart to figure out if they want to fix their relationship or it's like really over. Uh, and Agatha is writing this book, what she thinks is about weddings, but ends up actually being profiles of the students who attend uh, the University of Arkansas who live in Millie's dorm. So she starts giving Millie money under the table, as it were, to be able to eavesdrop on the students from Millie's room. So 
very uh, squeaky. But uh, one of the things that Kylie Reed always does well is dialogue. And the performance of Nicole Lewis is phenomenal. She does all the different southern accents. She is able to really get these characters to come alive in such a special and unique way. Uh, this book is a hot mess of, uh, of characters. These characters are rarely making good decisions. <laughs> it is just like exploding all over the place. But if you've lived in a dorm at a college, <laughs> you know you know what this is like and i just was really taken back i lived in the dorm for five years uh in, in undergrad and grad school and my last year i didn't have any roommates because i was a grad uh, graduate um assistant and so i i didn't have any roommates but i still lived in a dorm thankfully we all left each other alone because we all hated the dorm anyway <laughs> but i had uh two to three roommates every year of undergrad so i deeply related to so much of this book <laughs> Um, but it was a lot of fun and Kelly Reed always has interesting things to say. So one of my goals that I had um, in my goals video, which I will link down below, is to read more books on writing. So right now I'm trying to read one book a month on writing. Uh, and so I read A Thousand Words, A Writer's Guide to Staying Creative, Focused, and Productive All Year Round by Jamie Attenberg. She reads the audiobook, um, which is great. Um, it really is just a very encouraging book. If you are stuck on a project, if you want to learn more about different writers and their writing routines, this would be perfect. There are, well, you might not, that is a whole list of all the contributors. Um, and I could read some as highlights, like Megan Abbott or... I don't know, Maurice Carlos Ruffin or Benjamin Percy, um, Liz Moore. There are so many authors to just across the board who give their advice on different stages of writing and I just really enjoyed it. It was very encouraging and so I just sat with it and I annotated it and it was a beautiful experience. Would recommend. So you may remember in my TBR video I uh, pulled four books for me to read by the end of February. I read one of those in January. And so that is The Friend by Sigurd Nunes. This won the National Book Award several years ago and this is about a writer whose writer friend has died and so she ends up with her uh, writer friend's Great Dane but she's not allowed to have a Great Dane in her apartment. This is a book about grief. It's a book about longing and creativity and art. It is very well crafted but I just did not mesh well with it. I didn't really mesh with the prose style, the story. There was a, not really much of a plot to speak of, which is fine, but I don't know, the combination of structure and prose and everything just didn't work together for me. But at the same time, I can still appreciate and acknowledge like that this is very well done. It's just the style is not something I really enjoy as much reading. So I think it's more of an appreciation for the book, but I didn't necessarily enjoy reading what I was reading. Am I going to try Sigrid Nunez again? Yes, I own one of her other books and so I'm going to try it and uh, see if I like it. But I still think, you know, if you want to read Sigrid Nunez, please do. Uh, I think she's very talented, but not all writers are for everyone. And I feel like that is definitely a, it's a my problem, not a Nunez problem. So my next book is actually a novel in verse and that is A Nun, an epic by Linnea Axelson, uh, translated by Saskia Vogel. And this is about um, a Sami community. So a Sami are an indigenous people um, in northern Scandinavia and Russia, just that I'm, I'm pointing to the map in my head. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but they are Asami people who are across many different countries and they have many different traditions, etc. Um, and I, I don't think a lot of people realize um, uh, that Sami people are indigenous to that area and their history is um, complicated as they come into contact with colonialism. Um, this is about um, a bunch of different characters over the course of almost a hundred years and we kind of get updates on how the different governments are treating the Sami people um, and the different like laws and regulations they're putting in place. They, they migrate for example a lot um, and that's not something that the countries want them to do. They want them to stay in place but they like you know, go with their reindeer herds, it's like a whole thing. I knew a little bit about Sami people generally, and that was very helpful um, because this is a novel in verse. And if you are not like already aware of some, where the Sami live, for example, the countries that where Sami people, I guess, now live in, that could be confusing. So I would recommend just 
you know, looking up some basic things and then going into this book because it is in verse. It's very artistic. It's very impressionistic at places, but it is incredibly beautiful. And um, I, I really enjoyed listening to it. So another reread that I did um, is A Discovery of Witches by Deborah Harkness. <laughs> I don't know what to say <laughs> for um, my desire to read these. I, do, I, I don't, I don't know why. These, this is a series I read in undergrad and in grad school. And it really was nice to have something super fluffy and fun to read while I was on the elliptical. I was very, I was very into uh, my elliptical workouts um, at that time in my life. And so I would have my Kindle and I would just read them um, on, on the treadmills. And this is basically like, if you enjoyed Twilight, I would recommend this book. Um, it is definitely more adult, um, but it is just very interested in English history and all sorts of things. It has the same problems of like a, a ancient vampire who is in love with a woman who is a witch, but also very young, much younger than him. It's, it is what you would expect. I read this when I'm stressed at late at night if I can't sleep, but I cannot claim that there is a lot of substance to this book in any way, shape, or form. Did I enjoy it as much this time? Definitely not. Definitely not. It was not a situation where I wanted to pick up the next one immediately. I really don't like the second one. I just, it's in an Elizabethan England time period and it's not my favorite, but there is another book in the series coming out this year, which is why I was like, okay, I should reread these. And I have a friend who wants to read them. So I was like, well, I'll read, read them and see what happens. So. Okay, so my in-person book club, the one that read The Successor last time, um, our next book is The Comfort of Crows, A Backyard Year by Margaret Rankel, um, and this is the author of Late Migrations. Um, this is really a rumination on her backyard and her childhood with the natural world. She talks about having tadpoles, the birds that are in her yard. Um, but one of the things I think is most incredible about this book is the illustrations that accompany each chapter. Right. So the cover and all the illustrations are done by her husband. I will put the husband's name on screen, um, but she does uh, these little little sections. Each chapter is a week in the year, right? So you have winter week one, winter week two. And so each chapter of that, each week has its own illustration about what's going on. And then they have these beautiful like section pages between the seasons. So like, for example, this is Spring's page. Stunning, absolutely stunning. Um, if you like nature writing, like braiding sweet grass or something like that, then you will probably enjoy this book. The author is a columnist uh, for the New York Times. She writes a lot about the South, the New South, so like the more progressive South. She just like ruminates on living with the land and what that looks like, like trying to bring native you know, grasses and flowers back into her yard, like all sorts of things. And so I think this is a great book for you to read slowly over the course of a year, like reading one chapter per week. Like I, it's just a beautiful book, a beautiful gifting book. Um, and I really enjoyed it and was very glad that my friend picked it for our in-person book club. Um, and she reads the audiobook, which is delightful. So those are the books that I read in January. I'll be back soon with my February TBR. Um, and probably starting my February wrap-ups because, oh my stars, I read a lot of great books. I'll be back to talk about those, but thank you for joining me here, and I will see you all next time. Bye, friends.